Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the STEM Women's Summit. My name is Todd Cunningham, and I'm the Director of IT Services here at IUP. I will be covering a few technical guidelines for today's event. Please note that today's sessions are being recorded. All attendees are muted and will not be able to unmute until we get to the Q&A after the keynote presentation. Thank you, and I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Deanne Snavely, Dean of the Kopchick College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. Deanne. Hello, and welcome everyone to the IUP STEM Women's Summit. Obviously, it's virtual this year. <laughs> Uh, for 14 consecutive years, with a hiatus last year due to the pandemic, we have held a Women in Mathematics, Science, and Technology event. This event always was held during the IUP research uh, week and included students and faculty, and uh, we celebrated the successes of women in STEM and especially those who have graduated from our college. Um, this year, we decided that we would go virtual and do an event that is sort of like what we have done in the last years, but more with the opportunity for all of the graduates of our college to come together and celebrate the successes of women and underrepresented groups in STEM. Uh, my dream is that some of you are reconnecting with the Coptic College and will find this event stimulating and informative. Please make sure that you check out the alumni showcase and the attendee list on the event site. Um, if you are seeking further networking opportunities, please consider joining the Crimson Network. Uh, the link is at the top of the attendee list on the event site, and you can find that link in the email that we just sent you this morning, in case you're looking for how to uh, find that. So, um, IUP's president, Michael Driscoll, is a strong advocate for women and unrepresented groups in the STEM fields. President Driscoll is here with us today to welcome all of you to our event. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Snavely, and good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm really honored to be able to be here with you today as we honor and learn from women in STEM for their passion for achievement, discovery, teaching, and learning. I'm also thankful for all who are participating, especially I know we have a few IUP Distinguished Alumna Award winners out there among us. So it's great to have you back with us today. Our keynote speaker, Linda Willett, is going to talk to you about her accomplished career. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you, Linda. And I encourage you to take away something that you can use as you build your own successful future, your career. She's a great example of how an education in the STEM fields can prepare you for a rewarding career and a rewarding life. Certainly promoting careers in STEM for women is something that we at IEP have been championing for a long time. And I, as proof, I just wanna to talk to you about a couple of women who have made a huge impact on our university because of their work in STEM. The first is Anna Wink. I'm guessing that a lot of you don't know her name, but I know that you've been impacted by her work here, even though it ended some 52 years ago. Anna came here in 1963 after working for 23 years as a research associate in mathematics at Penn State. We recruited her as a faculty member and she was named the first director of the computer center, which was then in the basement of Clark Hall. At a time when opportunities for women to be leaders on a college campus were scarce, Indiana State College, as we were known then, was creating opportunities. Using an IBM model 1620 console computer, and kids, that's a lot bigger than any computer you've bumped into recently, certainly a lot bigger than my cell phone um, and uh, not quite as powerful. But anyway, using that IBM model 1620, Anna helped guide instruction and research in the computer field, which was still in its infancy on university campuses. By 1967, 
the computer center was occupying nine rooms in the basement of Sutton Hall. And a year later, the Department of Mathematics was offering nine computer related courses. When Anna was hired, only 60 students were enrolled in computer related courses. And when she retired in 1968, that number was more than 400. Anna's legacy can be seen everywhere at IUP. Everything we do these days is in some ways tied to computer use. And more than 50 years ago, she was leading the work right here at IUP. For my second example, I wanna look ahead just a little bit. In two years, Kopchik Hall will open its doors and it will become the hub of all of our STEM activities. It will help our students and faculty make amazing discoveries and it will separate IUP from the pack in scientific and mathematics research, learning and discovery. A key part of the planning for Kopchik Hall has been Deanne Snavely, Dean of the Kopchik College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. When Deanne came to IUP 10 years ago, she quickly realized that our science facilities were no longer adequate. Wyan Hall, for example, was built in 1965. And while we made great use of it by 2011, it was a bit outdated because of so much change in technology and science in the intervening years. Dean Snavely has been a huge supporter of the campaign for a new facility because she knows it will benefit students and faculty as they work and learn side by side in the name of science. But I, I would say that her true gift was her leadership in all facets of the plan. She brought together an incredible team of faculty, students and alumni and inspired them, inspired them to create a shared vision for the new facility. She included input from some key alumni with a mutual vision for the building and they showed their support in ways that have inspired us to construct a facility unlike any other in the region. And I can only imagine, Deanne, the pride that you're going to feel when the new Kopchik Hall opens in the fall of 2023. I hope many of you here today will be with us then when we open the doors and dive into more discoveries. And I hope that you know the role that Deanne has played in helping IUP become a leader in STEM disciplines. And certainly Deanne has been a remarkable scientist and is so in her own right and in her leadership role has tirelessly advocated for women in STEM. And Deanne, we appreciate all of that. It's a, another example in IUP's great history of supporting women in STEM areas. So thank you for that. So that's two of many, many women who've made a lasting impact on IUP in the STEM field. Efforts like theirs are what we celebrate with events like this one today. Again, I wanna thank you all for being here for your passion for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. These fields are critical to humanity. And during this pandemic, we all know how much science has impacted our daily lives. So please enjoy the day, enjoy the event. IUP appreciates all the contributions from the past, the present, and the future by women in the STEM fields. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, President Driscoll. And that was very, very nice. I did not see that coming and I really appreciate um, those words. It has been my honor to work with everyone on the planning of the new Coptic Hall. It has been absolutely an honor of working here at IUP. So it is now my great pleasure to recognize uh, the Patricia Hilliard Robertson Memorial Awardee for 2020-2021. This scholarship is awarded to an outstanding female science major enrolled in the Kopchik College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. Our alumna Patricia Hilliard Robertson earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biology completed a medical degree specializing in space medicine and became one of the very few women astronauts. Patricia Hilliard Robertson died tragically in a plane crash on May 24, 2001, and her family established this scholarship in honor of her memory. The Patricia Hilliard Robertson Memorial Scholarship for 2020-2021 goes to Mia Lenzi. And we could have the next slide. Mia Lenzi. Mia is a natural science 
and pre-physical therapy major with a minor in military science. She is in the IUP Army ROTC program and for that reason is unable to join us here today because she is participating in a mandatory field experience uh, for the next few days. After graduation, Mia will commission as an Army officer and she intends to continue her education. Uh, we have a few other details there in the slide that you can see. Um, and one of the fun ones there is the number of family members who are also IUP graduates. So uh, Mia comes from an IUP family and it is, she's an amazing young woman and um, we want to congratulate her. I also want to express my gratitude to Mrs. Hilliard and to the Hilliard family uh, for this scholarship and for the years of support that they have given to IUP, um, also a family of IUP graduates. And um, in past years, they've come and been part of this ceremony with us to honor the, uh, their awardee. So thank you very much. All right, so now I guess the moment we've all been waiting for, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Linda A. Willett. She is the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary for the Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey provides health insurance to cover 3.2 million people in the state of New Jersey. We are thrilled that Linda is here with us today to present the keynote entitled From Classroom to Boardroom, The Evolution of a Career, and in parentheses, including 10 principles for guiding a career. So there you go, Linda, we're all ears. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Snavely, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. It's an absolute delight to be with you virtually, and I am certainly there with you in spirit. Um, and I would like to thank Dean Snavely again for inviting me to do this and for reconnecting me with IUP, a place that I spent so many happy years. Um, although I have, have never worked in, in STEM, um, I, so I haven't had a career in science or technology or engineering or math, but I've certainly used the tools that were developed in each of those disciplines in my own work as a teacher and as a research manager and as a lawyer. In thinking through what I wanted to share with you this afternoon, I've assumed that a number of you, a number of members of our audience are just preparing for your careers. Some of you might be in starting your career, you might be in mid-career, or like me, you might be starting to think about retirement. So I chose a topic that I hope would be interesting and helpful and might aid you in helping others think through their own career choices. I tend toward personal stories when I speak because I have always found that that's an easy way for me to ground the messages that I hope to convey. So I've called this story from the classroom to the boardroom, the of a career. I just had to work science in there. So I got that evolution in there. And I'm including 10 guiding principles um, to guide careers. Um, and in some way, my story this afternoon will be an abbreviated version of my own career journey. But the real focus is the career development lessons that I have learned from others along the way. Our next slide shows you just a few of the buildings that uh, are important to me or have been important to me in my career. Um, Dean Stanley suggested that a few pictures might help. That gave me a slight challenge. When I speak, it's normally uh, in person, in a room with lots of people. 
and I uh, walk around the room, getting into people's space, uh, trying to keep them interested with the movement and less with the words. But I recognize that doing this virtually, maybe you needed more than just seeing me speak at you. So I've come up with an idea that I hope you will enjoy. So I matched each of the 10 principles with a picture of an animal that I've taken somewhere in the world. And I hope when we get to the Q&A session that somebody will either ask or try to guess where those animals were living when I took their pictures. I, my, my wonderful PowerPoint assistant, my dear husband, uh, put the pictures together with the 10 principles and I'm not entirely certain that we got them all matched the right way, but I hope you enjoy the pictures and I hope that the principles will be useful. So my own journey began in Johnstown, Pennsylvania in a modest, some might say poor family, lacking brothers and sisters and being a somewhat solitary person. When I wasn't in school, I would spend my days roaming around outside collecting rocks and insects and leaves and other items of interest. Just the other day, I told a friend of mine that if, if I found a skull, it was really a great day. And all she could say about that was, ooh. But everything got collected, brought back into my bedroom. And eventually I had a wonderful collection of animals, minerals, and vegetables. My mother decided that I had an inquiring mind and that I should study science. She was also of the era that valued job security. And so she decided that I should be a science teacher. And before I knew it, I was enrolled at IUP. Now, unbeknownst to my parents, and this is going to age me somewhat, I had become a really big fan of the TV show, Perry Mason, and I wanted to be a lawyer. I just loved the way he always got his guy and he always won the case. But my era was one in which we did what our parents told us to do. And so I came to IUP and prepared to be a science teacher. This brings me to one of the first guiding principles. Now, that is not a picture of one of my family members. I really don't have any left, but that's a wonderful turtle. And I thought that he, the look on his face would illustrate that first guiding principle of develop or foster in others an inquiring mind. Asking when, where, how, that helps us to continually learn about the world around us. And most importantly, asking others' thoughts, opinions, and stories as a strategy for personal growth. I am always surprised at just how many senior leaders and corporations, and I've worked in many of them, do not seem to have inquiring minds and or fail to listen to the contrary opinions. And I've often wondered if there's a correlation between the fact that there isn't an inquiring mind and they're not listening to others between those who have been successful or those who have failed in their jobs. And I posit that people with inquiring minds are more often than not to become leaders and become successful in their jobs. Now, my second guiding principle is let people know what you want from them and for yourself. My first job out of college was I did a summer stint. So I graduated from IUP in 1969. And I did uh, a summer stint at a prestigious research-based uh, organization in Pittsburgh. And I was quite generously called a lab assistant. Um, I think today I would be called a summer student or an intern, but I was called a laboratory assistant. And one of my male colleagues from IUP who had gotten the same degree that I got, we were both a, uh, off to aiming to be teachers, also got a lab assistant job, in fact, in the same lab. We were working on our master's degrees at the time at Duquesne University, identical master's degrees. I think you can tell where this story is going to go. So he was paid $220 a week. Ooh, that's a big sum. And I was paid $110 a week. 
And when I asked why, I was told that he would have a, get married someday and he would have a family to take care of and he would have to save money. And that was why they were paying him more money. And if I was lucky, somebody would marry me and take care of me. Well, somebody obviously did marry me and I, I have been taken care of quite nicely. But back then, I wanted $220 a week. And I respectfully challenged. And I said, well, I need $220 a week. And I was told at first, well, you're not getting it. And I said, well, then I guess I'll have to go and get another job. Well, for lots of reasons uh, that I, I don't have enough time today to tell you, uh, I was quickly paid $220 a week. So the con I make that conversation sound easy. Um, and it really wasn't as easy as it, as it sounded. Um, and I know that pay inequity for women still exists today. And it may have been exacerbated, by the way, by this COVID-19 pandemic, because so many women are dropping out of the workforce. When I look back at this episode, I do recall that I challenged respectfully and was fully prepared to look for another job. My parents were very upset because it was such a prestigious place to work, but I felt I needed to hold my ground. Individually and collectively, we need to continue to push our workplace for workplace equity in the broadest sense of that phrase. Now, in September of 1969, and we'll move to the next slide, I started my first teaching position. And I would remain a teacher for 11 years, first in Pennsylvania and then later in New Jersey. I was very fortunate to work under a science department who believed that the way we taught science would influence whether or not our students actually liked science. You know, you hear so many kids say, oh, I don't like science. And I find that so hard to believe because I loved every single science course I ever took. And and it, the way you teach science, she said, just might spawn the future scientists of the world. She said, build your own brand and make it work for you and for others. And so I chose this lovely cheetah as a fellow who probably built his own brand and his life works very well for him. Now, I must have been somewhat successful. Um, my students seem to like science. And that was a good early career lesson. Um, I like to think that the students, many of them went on to be science teachers. I do know that some went on to be medical med, uh, doctors. Some went on to be scientists. I'm still in touch with some of my very first students from 1970. Um, and I'd like to think that building, that they built their own brands too. But eventually I did decide to leave the classroom. Um, I liked teaching, but I really wanted to work in the pharmaceutical industry. My husband and I had moved to New Jersey and New Jersey has more pharmaceutical companies, I think, than any state in the United States. However, without an advanced degree in science, I, I thought it would be difficult to get a job. Uh, I did have a master's degree, but both my undergraduate and my master's degrees were aimed at education with a science blend to them. So what I did was uh, I found out that research uh, using computers was just starting as an aid to, uh, to identify uh, patent compounds that might be patented. Um, and that uh, companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies were seeking people who knew how to do that kind of research. And so I took myself off to the Rutgers School of Library and Information Science, and I got a degree that was heavier in the information science. And I learned how to do that patent searching using what was called the American Chemical Society system. And I then pitched myself to various uh, companies and I happily secured a position at Letterly Laboratories in their research library. Um, even before I finished the degree, actually. And that brings us to uh, an, another set of really important guiding principles. And this is where the slides will not necessarily match, but we'll get back to them later. That's, that's a lovely penguin protecting her babies. Um, but the next principle that I'll talk about and we'll come upon later 
is seek out your own opportunities. And if you can't find opportunities, make them for yourselves. Achieving my degree in library and information science allowed me to leverage into that pharmaceutical company. And I would be involved in the in pharmaceutical world over for the next 40 years by creating that opportunity. And I'd also say another guiding principle is to seek and embrace challenges and don't be afraid to take risks. So I actually started at that pharmaceutical company at night. I would teach during the day from roughly seven in the morning until three in the afternoon. And then I would head to the pharmaceutical company. Actually, I must have worked until two because I was working the three to 11 shift um, at, at, on their quality assurance line at the time. And when they offered me a job full time, I said, oh, I can't do that. I'm a tenured teacher and I'm earning $18,000. And they said, well, we're going to give you a full time job for $24,000. Um, I had to leave my teaching and I didn't know if it would work out. So don't be afraid to take risks. Mine certainly proved that, or it set the platform for 40 years of working in that industry. So I think we can go to the next slide. Who knows who's going to pop up here? Um, it's an understatement to say that the culture of corporate America is as different from the culture of a classroom as night is from day. Uh, teaching was and still is largely a career dominated by women. Although more and more women entered companies after World War II and in the 1970s, after the second wave of uh, women's rights and feminism, uh, very few made it into positions of real power until the dawn of the new millennium, actually. Today, we only have 41 or 8.2% of female CEOs and only about 22% of Fortune 500 company directors are women. Those numbers fall off dramatically for women of color. And although more progress is being made at the board level, and there is more progress in the C-suite, particularly for female chief financial officers and general counsels, there is not as much progress at the CEO level. And I raise these points because there are real gender equality, inequality minefields in the corporate world, and we need to navigate them carefully. So let's go back to that prior slide because this is where we're going to, I'm going to make an important point. So let's go, there we go. So my own journey up the corporate ladder began just after I had created the possibility of another opportunity by getting a law degree. Uh, I had spent, um, about 10 years, two of them in the library at Letterly Laboratories managing the patent searching function. And then uh, the CEO gave me a, a company uh, uh, to manage, which was a little scary, but I managed a consumer products company for about seven years and we sold it. And we sold it to Procter & Gamble and I really didn't want to move. My husband by then had become a superintendent of schools in New Jersey. And so I decided to take the hiatus and I got a law degree. Um, my desire to be Perry Mason was finally going to be fulfilled. So some portion of our population really likes lawyers and there's some portion of our population that really doesn't like lawyers. There's an awful lot of potential to do good in being a lawyer. But for those of you who've been reading the newspapers for the past couple of years, there are lots of ways to step in the wrong direction. I will always remember my first day as the oldest associate in the law firm of McCarter and English in New Jersey. I was 42 years old, associates are usually 25, and I was incoming class of 1990. Um, our managing partner said, protect your most valuable asset, your reputation. And that's what those little, those, that penguin with its two little babies, protecting your reputation. Now, along with building a strong personal brand, having a reputation for doing the right thing, not just the legal thing, but truly the right thing, 
carried me through many a challenge and a fair number of crises once I moved back into the corporate world. I had become a partner in my law firm my third year there because I brought in a very large client, a pharmaceutical company, uh, and very large revenue. And for those of you who are scientists now and thinking about becoming lawyers in the future, it's a wonderful, powerful combination, particularly if you're able to bring in clients. So I went back into the corporate world. Um, to say that I never stumbled would be wholly untrue. After litigating enough cases for a lot to last me for a lifetime of believing that I was the female Perry Mason, and after becoming a partner in my firm, I decided to move back to the corporate world, move on, and hopefully move up. The time, this time, I didn't need to create the opportunity, though, because my client, Bristol Mars Squibb, hired me to manage their law department and to work side by side with one of my former partners who had become their general counsel. He was both a mentor and a sponsor who had a profound impact on the rest of my career. And fortunately, when I stumbled, he helped me to get up and onto the right path. And that's why we're going to keep this, be self-confident, but be careful about self-promotion slide up. I had developed a great deal of self-confidence by the time I took the job. And maybe an ego that was just a little bit larger than it should have been. You know, after teaching science to high school students and getting them to really pay attention and like it, it's pretty easy to try a jury trial. Winning jury trials makes you feel pretty good. So there I did. I walked into this company and set about asking lots of questions and sharing my brand with others and letting them know what I wanted. And soon I was labeled as a self-promoter. Not a good thing in a company. Um, looking back, I would label myself as naive and unprepared for this new culture. The principle that I took away from this experience was to be self-confident, but be careful about self-promoting. This frigate bird is such a wonderful example, puffing that red chest out to say, look, look at me, here I am. So when I say that women, when I say to women, be careful about self-promotion, they often complain and say, well, men get away with it. Uh, so why can't I? And I point out that the, in males, the behavior actually is not perceived by other men as negative. Uh, not even in the frigate bird war, world, by the way. It just means, okay, you look good, so do I. Which one of us is going to get the gal? And I can say that after 50 years in the work world, the best way to approach this, uh, this minefield is to spend a lot of time listening, uh, learning about your work environment, and being interested in others, and letting them know that you're interested in them and you're interested in learning, as opposed to starting out right away by telling them about yourself. And, but quietly building your brand and maintaining your self-confidence. And that I think always wins out. When I coach women, that's what I normally say to them. Now, during the last decade of my career, and we can go to the next slide, who knows who will show up? Oh, there we go. Um, this is the seeking opportunities. This is a blue fit, footed booby and he's seeking opportunities to have a family. But during the last decade of my career, uh, I've gravitated toward sharing these insights with others as a means of career development, both formally in my own job. Um, I am 12 years into my current role. I do a lot of career development uh, with the people who work for me. And also informally, um, I mentor young women. I uh, mentor young men if they ask. I give talks like this, uh, hoping that people will formulate their own principles. And I've gotten a great deal of personal satisfaction from, from this, at, at this work at this stage of my career. And I truly believe that it is important to help others as you move through your own career. So let's see what's on the next slide. This is the seek and embrace challenges. This is a, a little uh, male uh, chin strap penguin. Uh, actually, he's running off to the ocean. Can we go to the next one? 
So helping others. Um, I don't know what these two turtles are doing, but they do look like they're helping each other. So it's really important to help others as you move through your career. You will be remembered for that. I, I, I don't think anybody remembers a single case that I won um, or that I helped somebody patent a chemical compound. But the students that I've taught often say to me, thank you for helping me and thank you for inspiring me about science. So as you, you know, we've, it used to be that the world uh, in, in the corporate world was all about outplacement, but in more recent years, it's the focus now is now on coaching. So we don't have to worry about outplacement. And graduate schools are already beginning to focus on teaching uh, courses on how to navigate careers and help others. So I think we're ready for the next slide. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning of, the, of this that I came from a relatively low income family, which created some insecurity uh, in me as a child when I found myself in what I considered wealth or surrounded by people of wealth. My favorite cousin and I were in uh, Miami one year and she wanted to go, we were 13, and she wanted to go into a really fancy hotel. And I wasn't really comfortable with that. Um, we were poorly dressed. I think we probably looked poor and I thought people would be stare, staring at us. And I told her, I'm not comfortable with doing this. And she looked at me and said, we're going to walk in as if we own it. Now she was very capable of doing that. I wasn't, but my friend and colleague at work, my friend Eileen Walks says, enter the room as if you own it. And to that, I would just add, just don't make it obvious that you think you own it. Um, and finally, uh, the North Star of my own career um, has really been to be honest, ethical, and kind. So the giraffe is the enter the room guy. I mean, you can't miss that guy. Um, and the, the lovely uh, Finch was being kind and honest and ethical. Some in the audience may say that these guiding principles are self-evident and something that we all incorporate in our own career development. But do we really? Do we do it consciously? Think about that. So if, no, if you take nothing else away from this, this little talk, think about whether you're, you are consciously embedding guiding principles in your own career or in mentoring or coaching those uh, who are just starting their careers. I urge you to examine your own career through your own guiding principles or these if they work or develop a set if you don't have them. And most important of all, please share them. Now, I hope that you enjoyed the pictures. I think we have a final one. It's not the giraffe, but the one after. There we go. So here it is. It takes a group, it takes a lot of people to make one person successful. And when I get praised for the work that I do by our board or by my CEO, I always say my team made me successful. So I hope you've enjoyed the pictures. I hope you have a few questions. And I'd like to open it now. Um, they can be anything from where did you take the picture of that blue-footed booby to uh, what are you going to do next in your life or any other question you have. So thank you for listening. And Linda, what a, what a great message. Uh, I, I just wanted to provide the rules of engagement a little bit for the Q&A portion of, of this, this at this time. So, um, we're gonna be using the raise hand feature to identify and allow folks to ask questions. When your hand is raised, you, you will be called upon and be asked to unmute. We will be monitoring the chat as well, so you can ask questions that way to the hosts. The raise hand feature can be found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can click on the reactions icon and the raise hand feature is within that. So uh, let's get those hands raised and let's ask Linda some, some great questions. Uh, Linda, would you like me to keep sharing the screen or? Um, yes, and are you going to uh, call on the questioners? Yep, yep. 
Uh, at this point, I don't see any hands raised, but uh, certainly, well, actually we have Diane. I see her physically raising her hand. I'm gonna go ahead and ask her to unmute. Sorry, I don't know how to use the raise your hand feature. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, my question, I'm gonna try to keep it short, but it, I have a lot of questions that have to do about uh, with mentoring. Um, the first one is, when you do mentor someone, do you choose them or do they choose you? And then the other question is how long do you do the mentoring and do you have a standard approach or does it vary with the person? So my preference is in mentoring is that the person who seeks to be mentored should choose me. And the, the reason that's my preference is that there has to be a chemistry, I believe. At least it, there has to be for me uh, with the person who wants to be mentored. And um, it, this may sound rude, uh, I don't mean it to be, but I've actually turned a few people down and, and politely, you know, in a way that, that worked well, um, simply because I didn't think the chemistry could develop. But having said that, I've mentored a lot of people and usually uh, people come to me, men and women, with a specific goal in mind or a specific need. And depending on what the desired outcome is, uh, it could be a short mentoring, a project where we say, okay, uh, a lot of people come and say, I, I want better presentation skills. We find that uh, th there are, there are they are so important uh, in order to take people to our board for presentations and they're eager to get before the board, but their presentation skills might not be good. Their supervisors might be reluctant to take them. So I get, and I think that's because I was a former teacher, I get people gravitating and wanting that. And that's usually short term. And, and if somebody can't get there, I'm candid to tell them, I'm sorry, I just don't think you're going to get there. Uh, sometimes in that case, we would hire an outside coach. There have been uh, people who have, I've been mentoring for years. Um, in fact, there is one young, young person, uh, young compared to me, uh, who is probably going to be my successor in my job. Uh, and I've been getting him ready for a few years and also getting our board ready to accept somebody who is a lot more junior than, than they are. Um, and it's always been very fulfilling, but the key has been they want it and I want it too. Diane, thank you for that question. Thank you. Okay, anyone else have a question? Uh, Deanne. Yes, my question is, the, about walking into the room like you own it. Um, this is something that I've thought about a lot. I'm a people watcher, and I especially love watching the dynamics in a meeting, you know, interpersonal relationships and the dynamics in a meeting and how people conduct themselves, but especially sort of that physical part of how they walk into a room. And I think this is something that um, is a bit of a snafu for women sometimes um, of how we navigate a room, how we attend a meeting and participate in a meeting. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that. I, I like the image of the giraffe because the giraffe just kind of wanders in, but is obviously in charge of everything that's going on. So um, what, I just thought you could elaborate on that point a little bit and how that affects women. Uh, so there are some pros and cons to, to uh, the style that I developed. Um, so going back to when I was 13, I, I had a tendency to walk with my head down. Um, uh, my, co my cousin was incredibly beautiful and uh, I, I wasn't. And so I'd keep my head down so people would be looking at her. And so she said to me, um, you need to walk with your shoulders back and your head up and forget about what you look, you know, your clothing looks like or whatever. Uh, and we did, and we walked into the fancy hotel and nobody cared about us. Um, but when I started trying uh, cases, 
I realized that a lot of my adversaries were male. They're a little bit like that frigate bird. You know, they would walk into the courtroom all chest puff up and here I am ready to beat this little woman. And so, and a lot of them were tall. And I, for some reason, I ended up trying a lot of cases in Texas um, where the judges would call me honey. And so what my walking into the courtroom became a function of how I dressed. And so I, in those days, I don't think I could do it now. I'd probably fall and break my leg. I wore incredibly high stiletto heels, um, dressed impeccably, um, you know, not expensively, but impeccably, uh, hairstyle done a certain way, jewelry and so forth. And I would walk into the courtroom and in my head, I would say, I am walking down a fashion runway. You know, he's just a bird puffing out his big chest, but I am walking down the fashion runway. And I knew it was successful when one of my adversaries said to the judge, Mrs. Willett is trying to prejudice the jury. All they can look at are her shoes and her jewelry. Um, but I, and the judge just laughed. But I carried that into the corporate world by continuing to uh, dress a certain way. And although I rail against that, and, and I love that we're sort of going to more casual dress, um, there was an expectation when, when I've, I've always worked in the C-suite of corporations, and there was an expectation on the part of the CEOs that we look like executives. And so whatever they thought I was supposed to look like, that's what I was doing. And you know, over time, that patina of self-confidence develops. And by the time I took my current job, frankly, I think I could walk in the room in a flower sack and it would be what I said and not what I was wearing. So I'm finally at the level of comfort. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Snavely. Um, I tell you what, we're gonna change it up a little bit. I'm gonna allow people to unmute themselves. That way, if you do have a question, you can just come out on, uh, and unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. But in the meantime, once you get some courage to do so, uh, we do have a question in the chat. Would you provide further insight on how to build your brand? And that comes from Karen Pizarczyk. Yes, thank you for that, Karen. Uh well, you know, I've always been a believer in uh, hard work, smart work. Uh, so it's not, it's not the hours you put in, but what you're producing. Learning, really getting good at what you're doing, no matter what you do, become good at it. And if you find out that you can't be good at it, um, then consider doing something else. So... When I was at IUP, we were required to take uh, several physical ed courses, and I had signed up for basketball at all of 5'2", and I was horrible at it. And uh, the instructor suggested that I do something else. I had already figured that out. Um, but I actually got was good at golf. Um, and over time I got better and better and better. And actually that ended up helping me in a number of my career paths, but it's, it's building the reputation for being good at what you do. And as a lawyer, I find that, uh, my reputation is for being able to solve problems and, and keep us out of problems, keep a company out of problems. So becoming good at that really means staying on top of everything, knowing what's going on, going back to that inquiring mind. Um, and, uh, and over time, if you just continue to work your craft and work it well, and know, know when to exit, know when to change, uh, it just happens automatically. So if, if we don't have any questions, I'm just going to quickly go through our friends here. Uh, uh, from my left, uh, the, the two, uh, those are two penguins or two, those, I don't think those are penguins. I've missed what those are, but those were taken in the Galapagos. The yellow finch was the Galapagos. 
the frigate bird was in the Galapagos. The tiger was in India. The one that I absolutely recognize as a penguin running to the ocean was taken in Antarctica. The giraffe was in Kenya. The penguin with its little chicks was Antarctica. The blue-footed booby was uh, the uh, Galapagos. The cheetah was Africa. Uh, the turtle was actually taken in the Galapagos and it was the oldest living turtle. His name was George. George has since passed on, but they were able to uh, uh, create other Georges. So he, he, his breed still lives. And those two little turtles are uh, actually right here in uh, East Hampton, New York. They're turtles that live near my pond. So one of my jobs afforded me the opportunity to travel all over the world and my hobby is photography. So this is, these are just a few of thousands of pictures. Okay, uh, if you wanna have, ask a question, you're welcome to unmute. Um, should be able to unmute yourselves now. Um, we're open to more questions. I just wanted to thank you for a very incredible and awesome presentation. Um, it's in, your achievements are, are just uh, invaluable to our alumni population and inspiring, but also to our male alumni as well. And, uh, you know, I'm the vice president for university advancement here, and we look forward to your participation in our distinguished alumni gala. Um, and uh, hope to see you in New Jersey, New York. Basically. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to it too. So Linda, I know, um, just, just a quick comment. I know I've been here for um, a little over 25 years now at IUP and, and I, I value the message that you bring because uh, these are all things that I wish I, I would have been told uh, at the start of my career because I, I think I could have used them. And quite frankly, I can still continue to use them today as, as, I, as I continue forward. So. I, I do value that that message uh, quite a bit, and and thank you for your time today. And it was it was great to get to know you these these past couple of weeks, uh, prepping for this this uh, you know today as the the STEM Women Summit. So thank you. So Todd, thank you so much for your help, and to our audience, thank you for uh, listening. And Dean Snavely, thank you for inviting me. And I look forward I look forward to the gala. I think it's April seventeenth. Um, and I also look forward to uh, participating more with IUP uh, and being a productive alum. So thank you all very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Well, great. Can, can I say something? Am I, uh, can anyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is, a, this is a Deanne Snavely. Thank you so much, Linda, for this presentation. It was really fun. Uh, inspiring and then entertaining. And I was thinking about, I, I, I agree with what um, Todd said that uh, as I speak with young people, um, oftentimes um, I, I start, you know, giving them advice. And some of the advice that you've given right now, I think I'll borrow um, as I interact with current IUP students. I often say that it's fun to, to meet the graduates of IUP, because when I am sitting talking with a young person who might be struggling in their classes or struggling with their family and their home life, whatever it is, struggles, I often think of them and then think about one of our wonderful graduates who have been so successful throughout their life. And I think, well, this person could be that, you know, 30 years from now, they could be that. And so what do I want to say to this young person that would help them become that person um, 30 years from now? So it's very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, so I guess we've come to the end of our session. Um, really great questions. And thank you so much for um, th those uh, questions that we had.
Um, we're please um, tune back in starting at 2 p.m. for the breakout sessions that you have all signed up for. And some of the people in the audience are going to be um, uh, running those breakout sessions. So I think those will also continue to be very interesting. Um, you can refer to the reminder email that Karen Pizarczyk sent to you to find the Zoom links. And you could also take some of this time to visit the site uh, website to look at our um, alumni um, uh, showcase and maybe to check out the Crimson Network. But um, until two o'clock when our next session starts, I take a nice break and thank you very much. Thank you.